We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hi there. Welcome to In the Past Lane podcast about American history and why it matters. Brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and coming to you from the Tree Hugger Studios, located in central Massachusetts. I'm your host, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell, and this is episode 190. Every week here at In the Past Lane, I tell you what happened in U.S. history this week, with special attention to one important story. So what's happening at In the Past Lane this week? Well, not much beyond working from home and perfecting my sourdough bread technique. I have a sourdough starter that's 16 years old and is, if I may say so, totally awesome. If you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, at In The Past Lane, you'll see some photos and some videos of my bread making. And if you want the recipes, just send me a message. And speaking of messages, I want to send out a message of thanks to everyone who's financially supporting this podcast. Most recently, Johnny became a monthly donor via Patreon, and Graham did it the old-fashioned way, with a check. All funds go to cover the cost of producing this podcast, so every little bit helps. So thanks. And if you want to help with as little as $1 a month, go to inthepastlane.com and click on support. All right, let's get on with it. Here's what happened this week in American history. Let's start with this. On April 22nd, 1970, 50 years ago this week, 20 million Americans gathered in places all across the nation to commemorate the first Earth Day. This event was inspired by two high-profile environmental disasters that took place the year before, in 1969. But before we dive into those stories, let's first step back to do a quick History of Environmentalism 101. While there were earlier environmentalist moments in U.S. history, what we would recognize as environmentalism began to emerge in the late 19th century. And as it did, it represented the beginnings, small beginnings, of a major shift in how Americans viewed private property rights. So what do I mean by that? Well, from the colonial period through the late 19th century, most Americans shared the belief that private property rights were almost sacred. A person could do anything they wanted with their property, and no government should have any say in the matter. And that was fine, so long as the nation remained rural and its economy based in agriculture. But it didn't. A little thing called the Industrial Revolution happened, and that raised all sorts of questions about private property rights. Some Americans began to develop a critique of the absolute sanctity of private property rights. And they did so in response to mounting evidence that unfettered private property rights in a modern industrial capitalist setting had seriously negative consequences for society. They noted, for example, that complete and total freedom from regulation left property owners free to engage in strip mining of mountain ranges for coal, or clear-cutting forests for lumber, or hunting various animals into extinction. Unrestrained private property rights also left them free to dump their toxic waste into the waterways that ran through their private property or into the air that hovered above their private property, even when this meant that the waste would ultimately end up on someone else's private property. And these critics were not anti-capitalist radicals. Rather, to make their case, they invoked a key Republican ideal, the common good. They argued that societies and governments needed to protect other things besides individual private property rights. They noted the uncomfortable fact that one person's freedom to use their private property any way they wanted could easily threaten another person's freedom to live free of poisons. Or, put another way, they noted that individualism and the common good often came into conflict. And so they developed a philosophy that emphasized what has become a key idea in environmentalism. The idea of connectivity. That people are connected to each other and to the larger ecosystem. That one person's actions, therefore, have consequences for others. And this fact needs to be taken into account as societies develop their laws and public policy regarding the economy and the environment. The first attempts to protect the environment mainly took the form of conservation, essentially saving wilderness from economic development. People like Theodore Roosevelt believed it was essential to preserve large tracts of wilderness to allow future generations of Americans to enjoy it by hiking, camping, and hunting. Few people in the late 19th and early 20th century raised concerns over water pollution, air pollution, or endangered species. By the mid-20th century, a few concerns over the environment emerged, things like smog and roadside trash, but these things received only minimal attention. The first significant change in public attitudes concerning the environment 
the shift from merely supporting the idea of conserving nature in wildlife reserves and national parks, came in 1962 when Rachel Carson published her book, Silent Spring. This landmark book revealed the devastating environmental effects of the widely used pesticide DDT. Carson's book became a bestseller, and it led to the introduction of more than 40 bills to control pesticide use in state legislatures all across the country. Another impact of Silent Spring was that it inspired many Americans to become environmentalists, or to use the term more in vogue in those days, ecologists. But it's important to point out that environmentalism in the mid-1960s was still a fringe movement, one associated with hippies and tree huggers. But Silent Spring had planted a seed that would later blossom with the events of 1969. So now let's turn to those two environmental disasters in 1969 that helped officially launch the modern environmentalist movement, the Santa Barbara oil spill and a fire on the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio. Let's start with the oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. It began on January 28, 1969, when workers on an oil rig forcefully extracted a drilling tube that had become stuck in the ocean floor. In so doing, they inadvertently created five gashes in the ocean floor. Over the next few weeks, more than 200,000 gallons of crude oil spilled into the Santa Barbara Channel. It took weeks to stop the gusher, and in that time, the incident drew significant media coverage. Americans began to see for the first time what are now familiar scenes to us. Oil-soaked birds, dead fish, and miles of blackened beaches. What's interesting is that this spill was not especially large, even for that time. And it's absolutely tiny in comparison to the 2010 BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. But even though it wasn't that big, the Santa Barbara oil spill of 1969 sparked widespread public outrage. Significantly, the anger focused on the lax government oversight of the oil rig and on the callous attitude of the executives of the company involved, Union Oil. The president of Union Oil, for example, told a newspaper reporter, I am amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. This statement not only reveals the mentality of oil executives at the time, but also the power of imagery in social reform movements. Think about how abolitionists used illustrations of auctions and whippings of enslaved people to draw supporters to their cause. Or how the pioneering photographers Jacob Reese and Louis Hine used their cameras to draw attention to horrific slum housing and child labor. History is quite clear on this point. Social reform movements need pictures. And in 1969, the fledgling environmental movement got their first compelling images. Out of this controversy arose a number of groups committed to environmental activism including Greenpeace. It also prompted a group of citizens in Santa Barbara to write and issue the Santa Barbara Declaration of Environmental Rights, an environmental manifesto modeled on the Declaration of Independence. It began, All men have the right to an environment capable of sustaining life and promoting happiness. That same year, 1969, witnessed another high-profile environmental disaster. This time it was a fire on the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland was one of the main oil refining centers in America, and its waterways showed it. In fact, the Cuyahoga River had caught fire many times in the past. But these fires were treated as little more than curious incidents. That finally changed when the river caught fire on June 22, 1969. It lasted only 30 minutes. But, as with the Santa Barbara oil spill five months earlier, this fire came with photographs and video. And it captured the attention of the national media. Time magazine ran a story that read, some river, chocolate brown, oily, bubbling with subsurface gases, it oozes rather than flows. The coverage of the fire and the subsequent attention it drew to the dreadful condition of the river led to a famous photo of reporter Richard Ellers holding up his hand after having dunked it in the river. It looked like he had dipped it in black paint. The Santa Barbara oil spill and the Cuyahoga River fire helped launch the modern environmental movement beginning a process that would move environmentalism from the fringes to the center of American society and political discourse. They inspired a small number of environmental activists to stage what they called conscience-raising events, which in turn inspired a major one they decided to call Earth Day. This event had many so-called fathers, but most people agree that Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin got the ball rolling when he proposed the first nationwide environmental protest to, in his words, shake up the political establishment, and force this issue onto the national agenda. The idea caught on, and on April 22, 1970, some 20 million people participated in the first Earth Day, which was marked by large rallies, cleanup efforts, and teach-ins. Earth Day became an annual event, 
and one of its most important effects was that it brought together lots of disparate groups that shared concerns about the health of the environment. These included people concerned about air pollution in cities, wildlife and endangered species, protection of wetlands and forests, and cleaning up toxic landfills. Earth Day also raised public awareness of environmental concerns and eventually made them mainstream political issues. As with so many other reform movements, over time these environmental activists managed to transform their goal from a radical idea to a mainstream one. And some of the most important achievements occurred relatively quickly. The period from the late 1960s to the early 1970s saw the most environmental legislation passed in the nation's history. Everything from the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. These and many other laws have had an extraordinary impact over the past 50 years, leading to a more healthy environment and the saving of many endangered species, including, most famously, the bald eagle. But many American business leaders and property owners have never liked these laws. They claim they hurt business and infringe upon the liberties of property owners. And they've waged an unrelenting war on environmental regulations. They achieved some success in the 1980s with the presidency of Ronald Reagan and in the 20 aughts with George W. Bush. But the most serious and successful efforts to roll back 50 years of environmental protection have occurred very recently under the presidency of Donald Trump. In just three years, nearly 100 environmental rules on everything from toxic chemical emissions to fracking have been revoked or seriously limited. These moves all but guarantee that we will have greater environmental damage and harm to human health in the coming years. And because this administration has been mired in controversy from day one, few people seem to have noticed. The story of environmentalism and Earth Day remind us that history does not move in a straight line of progress. One generation's achievements can be undone by a later one. That's why it's never enough just to win a victory for voting rights or equality before the law or a healthy environment. Those victories must be maintained and protected by constant vigilance. That's what citizenship is all about. Otherwise, as we have seen, they can be rolled back. So what else of note happened this week in U.S. history? April 20th, 1914, the Ludlow Massacre took place in Ludlow, Colorado. Hundreds of Colorado National Guard soldiers and a private security force employed by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, a company owned by the richest man in America, John D. Rockefeller, attacked an encampment of 1,200 striking miners and their families. More than 20 people were killed, including wives and children of the miners. This massacre set off a spiral of violence that left somewhere between 69 and 200 people dead in what came to be called the Colorado Coalfield War. April 21st, 1980, 40 years ago this week, an unknown runner named Rosie Ruiz stunned the world by winning the Boston Marathon and doing so in record time. That is, until it was revealed that she ran only the last half mile of the 26.2-mile course. After an investigation, Rosie Ruiz was stripped of her medal. April 22nd, 1864, the United States Mint issued a two-cent coin, which was the first U.S. currency to feature the slogan, In God We Trust. And what notable people were born this week in American history? April 21st, 1838, environmental activist and conservationist John Muir. April 23rd, 1791, President James Buchanan, widely considered to be one of the worst presidents in American history. April 26th, 1822, Landscape architect and the man who designed Central Park in New York City, Frederick Law Olmsted. And April 26, 1900, seismologist and physicist Charles F. Richter, who invented the Richter scale to measure the power of earthquakes. Okay, time for the last word. Let's give it to the pioneering conservationist and environmental activist John Muir, who was born 182 years ago this week. Here's something he wrote that seems remarkably in sync with the idea behind Earth Day. Man must be made conscious of his origin as a child of nature. Brought into right relationship with the wilderness, he would see that he was not a separate entity, endowed with a divine right to subdue his fellow creatures and destroy the common heritage, but rather an integral part of a harmonious whole. He would see that his appropriation of Earth's resources beyond his personal needs would only bring imbalance and beget ultimate loss and poverty for all. Well, that's going to do it for In the Past Lane this week. You can learn more about me and everything we talked about at InThePastLane.com. 
and let's interact via social media. I'm at In The Past Lane on both Twitter and Instagram, and our Facebook page is In The Past Lane Podcast. See you next week. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. Mm-hmm. <laughs>